One thing that came to mind was, you know, the way the uh, the uh, prana and uh, akasha as the sort of, you know, I was thinking of them as sort of like uh, primordial matter and primordial energy, you know. Yes. Uh, before it gets to the sort of differentiation that we perceive on Earth. Yes. How, how do they connect with Ishvara? Okay. You know, so, you know, I'm sort of thinking of the emanation of them out of the absolute. Am I sort of totally like off being there? I'm, I'm no, not... no, no. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, so, we can start from the very beginning, which says where where we have pure being. Let's call it the absolute. Mm -hmm. Then the question is, uh, we are not experiencing the absolute. What we are experiencing is the relative world. How do we get from the absolute to the relative is the most profound question. Yeah. And uh, so we invoke uh, something which is, uh, it's an apparitional causation. Yeah. But in apparitional causation, there must be some evidence, there must be some signatures of the original thing. Mm. And since the original absolute does not have any qualities, uh, we can't relate it to qualities, but we can relate it to what we feel are essences, because what we have as an absolute is not non-existent. It is existence. Mm. And so being existence itself, then we say, we show, surely it is pure existence. Pure existence means the thing that doesn't come or go. Mm. So pure existence equates to pure reality, the thing which is permanent, not, subject to, time, not subject to time or place or conditioning, mm. you see? And so the absolute, uh, as it were, conditions itself. Yeah. And now how does it condition itself? It conditions itself by projecting an appearance. And so therefore it's not just that it is pure existence. Pure existence comes out in the relative really as these raw materials, Agasha. Well, at least Agasha. Yeah. Something is existing there. Mm -hmm. It's undefined, it's unshaped, it's unmanifest is Avyakta still. So there are a number of sta stages for, for that to happen. Firstly, there has to be some creative impulse, which is there. Some personalized creator does it. It creates this Akasha, it creates this prana that acts on it. It's pure energy. And that in turn comes essentially from an unmanifest condition because what we call a cosmic mind or a creator is something which is certainly active and produces things, manifests things. But it is not under any illusion. It's not under any spell of Maya. It is free and perfect in that sense. And it comes from another unmanifest and this we call, we can put an umbrella term there as nature itself. And this we might call God with no quality, with, with no form, but certainly qualities are there. Omnipresence is there, omniscience is there, omnipotence is there. It is uh, that which is uh, not suffering under any illusion, therefore not suffering any pain. In fact, Patanjali himself, since we are studying uh, the science of religion, we'll say that Ishwara, that supreme, it's his, you know, it's his pressure, 
Garosa, it starts off like that. Ishwara, the supreme ruler, is a special Purusha. In this philosophy, we're all different Purushas, we're different selves, but this is a special one because it's not touched by misery or by actions or their results and desires. And we may also call it Maya itself. We may also call it the principle of the appearance. And that is how we go from the absolute to the relative. Mm -hmm. The principle of appearance, and therefore we can give some alternate terms to it. Maya is a term. Now, I think recently, when I say recently, maybe one year ago or so now, the Catholic Pope Francis had a problem with the wording of the Pater Noster, the Christian prayer of the Our Father, the words of Jesus in response to teach us how to pray. And so it's useful in understanding this hierarchy to see that uh, we can rephrase it. So, now, of course, it's a Jewish prayer. And for that reason, it is a, a, a patristic one. So we can say it says our father. We could equally say our mother. Our mother, who art in heaven, we have to take into account Jesus saying, the kingdom of heaven is within us. Holy is your name. How to be thy name? Well, what is thy name? Because from the mother, that is this Ishwara or this Maya, comes out the sun, comes out uh, this manifesting word, Om. So blessed is your name. What is the name? The name is Om. So hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, may our freedom come along, may our perfection be realized. On this earth as it is in heaven, in other words, may my personal will be aligned to this cosmic will. And then give us this day our daily bread and give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And what the pro problem that the Pope had in the wording was, lead us not into temptation. How can God lead you into temptation? Yeah. <laughs> so we can rephrase it. Deceive us not by your Maya. See? Deliver us from the evil from the pain imbued world. So this, this is a, a, a useful rephrasing to see how we get from the absolute to the relative step by step, mm -hmm. because that prayer contains it all actually. Mm -hmm. So uh, that being that uh, is responsible for rhythm and purpose, and direction in the universe that replenishes everything, and then moves everything towards a central goal that manifests everything. This we call the special Purusha, which is Ishvara. And that is the interlink, if you like, in the absolute. But we have to be careful in thinking that it's something different. Just because it's a registered category does not mean it's different. It's the same thing, but with the effects of time and space, causation and function. And with the um, with the projection of it, with the projection and hiding faculty of it that we find in Maya, these are the three evolutionary forces. These are the three gunas. We've mentioned two of them. And so, what is the formula? How do we get back to the pristine purity, where things are reflected uh, as they are? In other words, the reality shines through by itself, and it becomes self-evident. Well, we engage that particular force, which we call sattva. And sattva simply means everything that is illuminating, everything that is noble, everything that is cleansing, everything that is full of the highest moral values, everything that is the highest, the highest ethical values also, but everything that gives an internal insight and 
purification and a, a way of showing us so that we make the mind our illuminating lamp. That's the purpose. And it's only through this mind that we get our pure knowledge because this mind is actually cosmic mind. Its headquarters is cosmic mind, headquarters. Mm -hmm. So we have this agasha, we have it acting or being acted upon by prana. And prana really is that manifestation of movement, of projection, which is there. It comes from these gunas. And so you can see how consciousness now is entering into and being framed by the conditionality of time and space and causation. And that makes it move, that makes it be seen to be moving, is a better way of putting it. Yeah. Being seen to be moving. On what is it moving? It is moving on matter which doesn't wish to move. It's just happy to stay there. So this is Akasha. We might compare it really in a sense to inertia as an energy, or we might compare it to just stuff you know, under the influence of gravity. So gravity is a key operating force. And energetically, when prana and agasha combine, then we can really call it gravitational energy. And agasha, therefore, is a gravitational field in which it operates. So why there should there be such a thing as agasha? Why should there be such a thing as prana? because agasha is evidence of something that exists and prana is something is evidence of something that moves something that is consciousness expressed it's a mobilizing thing when you put your mind to something then you move it when you decide that you will do some gardening and you decide you'll cut a tree here and plant a tree there it is because you have consciously decided it. You, the intellect is in charge. But what is the stuff? The stuff is overpowered by your will to move it. So this will or operation of the mind expresses itself in action. And so it takes a will to move these things. There's an internal will that does it. And this will is thy will be done that sense so this will is this cosmic mind that wishes to expand as it were for this reason it is also called brahma Bra, meaning also expansion but not to be confused with brahman which is the absolute or brahmin which is a knower of brahman theoretically but this week we decided that we would talk on prana because Swami Vivekananda in his Raja Yoga picks this subject up. But it is useful, since we had started off speaking about the origin of this, to see what uh, the Putanji Yoga Sutra commentary has to say, as given to us by Swami Vivekananda. And he admits it's a repetition of his earlier chapters in the first section of his book, book meaning Raja Yoga. We began, by the way, this study because a devotee had asked me, can we have a private study of the Raja Yoga? And we did it, but then they found it very difficult to meet a weekly commitment on it. And I said, why not, let's be much more generous why don't we actually use it as a topic for Tuesday evenings? And rather than call it the Royal Yoga or Raj Yoga or Dhyana Yoga, Yoga of Meditation, let's rather call it in line with Swami Vivekananda's approach to it, the science of religion. This is our own words, science of religion. And that means that, and we described it last time, when we talk about religion, we're not talking about doctrines, dogmas, what Swami Vivekananda calls secondary details. What we're talking about is the primary investigation, scientific investigation, 
and answer this question, who am I, what is uh, the universe all about, and so on and so forth, I have to take consciousness that as my birthright, that naturally wants to flow out through the avenues of the senses and draw it inwards. So meditation, as opposed to prayer, is going inwards. Prayer is really going outwards. It's like breathing in and breathing out. When you breathe out, we can say it's prayer. When we breathe in, we can say it's meditation. So what is the practical use then and connection with breathing and prana in light of the fact that Swami Vivekananda starts this and a previous passage with the same thing. He says, by throwing out and restraining the breath, this is a way of uh, enhancing concentration. But you see, what does Swami Vivekananda say about this? He said, the word used is prana, energy. Now, I deviate a little bit because it is understood, and I've said it quite a few times, the human body is like a magnetic field of energy. We know this because physiologically we eat food and food is not energy. Food is stuff. Food is like agasha. But we apply something to it. We apply the digestive power to it with all the enzymes within the human body. We break it down to the sugars and we make an energetic exchange because we have an electrolytic system and in this electrical exchange, using what is called ADP and ATP, adenosine diphosphate, adenosine triphosphate, we are able to lend energy, metabolism, that process makes the food that we feed in, converts it into energy. And then we move about doing wise and foolish things, moving the limbs, and so on, and bombing people, and all the rest of it. And the brain also runs on it. Chandogya Upanishad tells us, you know, gives us this example, please stop food fast. Then after a few days, okay, now let's test out your memory and your mind. And the person finds the mind is weak, you know, because you need food. The mind, as it were, that is the operation of the brain, requires food. And mind itself, is seen to be a material thing. Even though it's more subtle and has no borders for that reason, no visible borders anyway. And so there's a magnetic field called mental field. And then there's a magnetic field, which is a physical field. And it is made energetic and, and uh, it is made magnetic by the pranic body. What does that mean? Instead of thinking that there's one body, we have to think like a physiologist studying anatomy and say, okay, so there are several bodies. When you want to study it, there's circulatory man, there's a neurological man. See, there's a, a, um, what do you say, muscular man and so on and so forth, skeletal man and so on. And so, all right, if there are different layers and levels, like sheaths, kosha it's called, so the outer level is made from food, there's no doubt. And it is that converting aspect. A corpse cannot do it. A corpse is a body nonetheless, but it requires something else, some activating principle. It has to be there. And that we call prana. What is prana? Prana is energy. It is not breath and has nothing to do with breathing, says Swami Vivekananda. Literally said, the word used is prana. Prana is not exactly breath. It is uh, the name for the energy that is in the universe. And he goes on to give many, many examples, just to clarify this point. When I started studying yoga and yoga exercise and so on and so forth back in about 1968, uh, there was an impression in uh, yoga classes, oh, breathe in prana, feel the prana infuse the body. So you see, thinking that is a substance, something like nitrogen or oxygen or something like that. 
But you see, prana is not exactly breath. It is a name for the energy that is the universe, that is in the universe. And whatever you see in the universe, whatever moves or works or has life, is a manifestation of this prana. And you can use as many examples as you like, from a steam train to the sun and the moon and the stars and the spinning galaxies. The sum total of the energy displayed in the universe is called prana. Now, Swami Vivekananda wanted to make this whole subject very scientific because prana is energy. And, of course, in his day, the word energy wasn't necessarily used. It was force was the word used. That's why Newton also uses this force equation. And he equates it to mass and uh, acceleration and all the rest of it. So the force has to be applied to make something move. And that is why prana has to move akasha. Some force has to be moved. You can call energy now force. But he understood really that the yogis had, had seen energy is really pretty much everything. Energy is the sum total of something called energy. And energy is equivalent to matter. This is the yogic understanding. When we talk about prana and akasha distinct, that's not exactly true. We describe it like that, no doubt, to make the distinction. But maybe prana is that which is that energy which is acting on and within space. And maybe that kind of prana is gravitational energy. And gravitational energy is easily converted into kinetic energy. A simple scientific experiment, not even scientific, but a simple experiment you can do here and now. You can take a pendulum and you can swing it from here from the top and gravity takes it down and as it reaches the bottom, it's converted into upward swing, kinetic energy. Potential energy, kinetic energy. Potential energy, kinetic energy. And kinetic energy, therefore, is represented by that tattva called vayu, not literally air, but the thing that we find and gets distributed everywhere and the thing that is much more dynamic than its equivalent of agash or ether. So Swami Vivekananda was interested to see is any scientific experiment which would verify this equivalence. And he asked his friend Nikolai Tesla, brilliant, brilliant man of his time, originating the alternating current that was so evident in the Columban Exposition, and he obviously got pipped to the post, as it were, because it was uh, Einstein and his wife who really got hold of the appendix to special relativity and gave this most famous equation that everybody knows, E equals M. So E equals M, I know that E equals M C squared. Forget about the C squared. We have to understand that C squared was put in to reconcile minute quantities because energy was measured in ergs and mass or matter was measured in grams. And how to reconcile ergs and grams. So you have to have some kind of measure and the measure is the speed of light, C. And so speed of light squared is nothing really directly to do with the speed of light but it reconciles all these, so these, um, so in other words, it's going at a rate, it's moving at a rate. But you see, the C is a constant. And if that constant is one, one squared is still only one. So mathematically, it's really irrelevant to the equation. You might say E equals M. Now that's very profound, and naturally it's a famous equation because it is so revolutionary and so misunderstood, so misinterpreted. Because many, many science, scientists would say that it is, you see, a transformational equation. It means energy can be transformed into matter. Matter can be transformed into energy when you apply a certain velocity, a speed of light. But that's not the case. That's not how it's supposed to be read. If it was supposed to be read like that, then it would have been a different equation entirely. It would have been 
uh, something like E plus M equals K constant. So we can't take it like this. We have to take it as it was written and as it was intended. Now there's a, a reason why scientists take it like that, and that's because they don't like to deal with the radiation aspect, which doesn't seem to conform to anything and so on. But radiation is an intermediate thing. So if we go from gravitational energy, potential energy to kinetic energy, then that activity produces heat radiation. Now we have another tattva. So this is another form of energy. And ultimately, that produces in a magnetic field, electromagnetic field, formerly called electricity and magnetism, now combined as electromagnetism. And on top of that, what wasn't discovered in the ancient days was the nuclear forces, the weak and strong nuclear forces. So how is it that these ancient people understood these things with no, seemingly no kind of laboratory equipment to do it. And Einstein himself didn't really use any laboratory equipment either. He gave a thought experiment and then threw it out there and said, okay, you proved me wrong. And so far, everybody has proved him right. So we're left now, unfortunately, with a legacy of thought experiments. And no scientist will be able to tell you what is energy. They'll only be able to say what is its effects. But there's one primordial thing according to our yogis, which says there is prana. And how is it they're able to establish without any instrumentation? It is the sheer power of concentration. This is their major tool. That means taking this thing called attention as part of the mind and steering it consciously, deliberately, making it a light, as it were, on an object. And when you do that, you make the object yield its hidden secrets. And so this was the technique, the scientific technique, that these yogis would have used. So now let us go on to see what the relationship is with the breath. So he says, the sum total of the energy displayed in the universe is called prana. This prana, before a cycle begins, remains in an almost motionless state, almost motionless state. And when the cycle begins, the prana begins to manifest itself. What do we mean by, pra, by cycle? We mean this. The cosmology of the yogis would be the same as the Sankhyas, and that is, we, there is no such thing as a beginning to it, nor an end. There's a beginning of a cycle and an end of a cycle. And this question of having a cyclical universe is now being taken seriously and has been taken seriously by modern scientific cosmologists. Seeing the seeming failure of a Big Bang cosmology or even a Big Bounce cosmology, something that has an origin. Now theologians might be quite upset if the Big Bang goes away, don't forget. The Big Bang was a suggestion first made by Lemaitre. Lemaitre was a Roman Catholic priest. And uh, he came to Einstein and he came with his, you know, math mathematical calculations to say, I think there was something. Of course, the expression Big Bang wasn't there in the first place. It was given by Fred Hoyle, who didn't believe in this Big Bang. He was more uh, believing in a steady state condition. And uh, so Einstein remarked, well, your mathematics are quite good, but unfortunately, you're not a very good physics person. And uh, we dismissed the idea of a hand until Hubble sees that the universe seems to be moving or the elements in the universe seem to be. There are bodies which are going into the redshift part of the spectrum. And that means that they're moving away from us. And then when you correlate it with the spectrum and with the distance and with the redshift, you get this uh, Hubble, uh, this Hubble curve. You can correlate the velocity with the distance, and so Einstein had to admit, "All right, sorry, I remove my cosmological constant that uh, doesn't allow this to happen. That creates a steady-state balance." 
Now, of course, if you wind things backwards, you come to a point. And uh, that point is now a problem because then the next question is what happened before this point that is called a singularity? And scientists will say it's a meaningless question. Don't even ask this question because all time and space was appeared in an, in an instant of an instant of an instant of an instant. The whole thing appeared and everything appeared and all matter appeared in that, in that moment. Now, this is compatible in a way, or could be compatible with this idea of a universe that is in a cycle and it, it, it gets projected and then it dwindles and it goes back to its state of quiescence or potentiality. The difficulty, I suppose, is that the Big Bang cosmology has a lot of problems with it. And so maybe there's a different way of looking at it. And many scientists are now looking at this recycling model or to see how we can use it because the ancient people understood it. Were they correct? Now, of course, logically, everything goes in cycles, not bicycles, cycles. So everything has a beginning, has a middle, has an end, and it would, you know, seasons come and seasons go, and everything is moving around in a circular way. We have birth, life, death, birth, life, death, birth, life. We have a seed that develops into a tree that begets a seed, and so it goes on. So we can see very clearly that nature has a cycle of seasons and other things. And if there's a rule or a law which says what happens you know, here or in one place would be the basis for everywhere, supposing you apply that axiom, then you'd be inclined to say the whole universe is doing the same thing. It's like the whole universe is breathing in and breathing out. That's what it's seemingly doing. And so the calculation of, of that, of course, and we can see in many places, Bhagavad Gita contains it to start with. And a part of that, a part of the breathing out of the universe, a part of the creation of the universe or the projection of it would be that there is a new, a new Brahma. So things are measured, the cycles are measured in terms of days and nights of Brahma, the creator. So we can say like this, about 4.3 or so, let's call it, 4.3 billion years. And uh, this is uh, one, one uh, mini cycle, if you like, by one, one kalpa, 4.3 billion years or so, close to the origin of the Earth and the solar system is calculated to be around about 4.4, 4.5 billion years. And then uh, we say, okay, so that is, uh, let us say that that is, that cycle is um, one day of Brahma, and then you double it, that's one night. And then you take the human calculation, okay, so if that is equated to human years and so on and time frames, then you take that and you times it by, let's say, by a day. So while it's a day and a night, you times it by then a year, you times a year by a hundred. hundred is supposed to be the lifetime of Brahma. And then you'll find everything gets sucked back into this primordial nature, Prakriti. Regardless of how many years you think about it, eons of time pass. And then it's all withdrawn. It's like it's projected and then it's withdrawn. That's the idea of this. So at the beginning, when he says at the beginning, he's taking this model into account. It is this prana that is manifested as motion, at the ner uh, as the nervous motion in human beings or animals, and the same prana is manifesting as thought and so on. So two things are being mentioned. The neurological system, and this is a nervous system which is a physical system, but we also have to take into account it manifests itself, is the word, as motion, 
as the uh, nervous system in human beings from what? From a more subtle system that is the pranic body distributed through subtle channels or nadis. And we can really trace these nadis, we can correct these nadis, we can balance them and so on and so forth. The system of kinesiology will do it for us and we can experiment nicely what is your magnetic field and how can we alter it? How can we change it? How can we restore it? And those who know me will know that we can do it very easily. So, so as motion in human beings and, or, or animals and the same prana is manifesting as thought, and that is why he has a whole chapter called psychic prana. So when you say pranayama, control of prana, you, you have to include the control of thought. And if you can control thought, then you can control the whole of the energies, energetic system and the whole of the nervous system and the whole of the muscular system. That is pranayama. But breathing is a secondary alternative. And there are many authors, well, there are many holy people, Swami Brahmananda was one, and if you see what he says, he does not recommend in his teachings the use of pranayama or breathing kind of pranayama. And there's a very good reason for that. Don't forget, pranayama is a stage that is preceded by other stages, asana, yam, yam. All of these are pre-stages to, to this pranayama. If the nerves won't settle, then you do, can do some systematic breathing. If the nerves won't settle by shifting and changing your thinking, doing mental pranayama is what I would add. And so the whole universe is a combination of prana and agasha, so is the human body. Out of agasha, you get the different materials that you feel and see, and out of prana, all the various forces. Again, you see he's using forces, he's not using the word energies. Now, this throwing out and restraining the prana is what is called pranayama. Patanjali, the father of the yoga philosophy, does not give very much particular directions about pranayama. But later on, other yogis found out various things about this pranayama and made of it a great science. And with Patanjali, it is one of the many ways, one of the many ways. And those of you who have a text, by the way, can underline this. I don't know uh, if it's different page and different versions, but I'm reading from page 150 of the Raja Yoga. And here I have underlined very heavily many ways. Uh, but he does not lay much stress on it. He means that you simply throw the air out and draw it in and hold it in for some time, that is all. Or hold it for some time, that is all. And by that, the mind will become a little calmer. But later on, you will find that out of this is evolved a particular science called pranayama. And we shall hear a little of what these later yogas have to say. Now, some of this he says, I have already told you before, but a little repetition will serve to fix it in your minds. I'm very pleased he said that because when I talk, many people who listen to my talks will see much repetition. But first, he says, you must remember that the prana is not the breath, but that which causes the motion of the breath. In other words, that which causes the movement of the diaphragm muscle. That which is the vitality of the breath is the prana, the vitality, the one that's giving life to the lungs and to breathing. Now, Breathing is not just an internal process. You require external air, and you require some mechanism, mechanisms. You require some machinery. 
require lungs that have the capacity and the flexibility to inflate and deflate. You have to have lungs which have all the alveoli within them, small cells that can exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. You have to have these in a certain cavity, which is beautifully designed to house them. And unfortunately, many people use them as smoke houses, creating a lot of carbon and tar and all kinds of things in the human lungs. So again, the word prana is used in all the senses. They are all called pranas. So how do the eyes see? It is through prana. How do the ears hear? Through prana. How do, do, does the liver work as it works? It's just through prana. How does the heart pump? It is through prana. How do the cells get repaired? How do they do their work? Through prana. The mind is called prana, he says. He says, again, the word prana is used for all the senses. They are all called pranas. For, and the mind is called prana. And we see that prana is force. And yet we cannot call it force. Again, we have to edit a little bit. And we can substitute his word force, which was the scientific word in those days for energy. Because force or energy is only the manifestation of it. It is that which manifests itself as force or energy and everywhere else in the way of motion. The chitta, and you recall from previous talks, the chitta is mind stuff. The chitta, the mind stuff, is the engine which draws in the prana from the surroundings and manufactures out of it, out of prana, the various vital forces. So you'll have heard of the five pranas. And the five pranas then, how do they arrive in the body? It is through this mechanism. Those that keep the body in preservation and thought will and all other powers. And by the above mentioned process of breathing, we can control all the various motions in the body and the various nerve currents that are running through the body. First, we begin to recognize them, and then we slowly get control over them. So the simple pranayama is not quite as simple as you think. It's only because it's contained in aphorism or sutra that it looks, oh, we gross over that prana, we all know what pranayama No much more to it. Now, these later yogis consider that there are three main currents of this uh, prana, three main currents, three main avenues. We can imagine it a little bit like an electrical wiring system where currents are carried along and the brain is the most complex of all wired systems. And we see that the wire itself is just a jumping mechanism in terms of the brain. So the main currents of this prana in the human body, which are they? Well, one they call Ida, another they call Pingala, and the third they call Sushumna. And Pingala, according to them, and he's very careful in his language, don't blame me, according to them, is on the right side of the spinal column. And the Ida is on the left side, and in the middle of the spinal column is the Shushumna, as an empty channel. Now Ida and Pingala, according to them, these are the currents working in every man, and through these various uh, currents or channels, we are performing all the functions of life. This is very important to pause there a little bit and consider what is being told. Now, according to the system, every motion in the human body is a distribution from these two central currents of Ida and Pingala. And these are 
not just currents of prana, but the effects of them are polar. They are subject to magnetic polarity. We can test it out. So therefore, we can see them as it were scientifically. Now he says, Shushumna is present in all as a possibility, but it works only in the yogi. It doesn't work for anybody else. You must remember that yoga changes the body. Why does it change the body? Because the foundation level is pure spirit and everything else is manifested from it. Of course, we can shift the idea even higher to the Vedanta ideal. Actually, there's only spirit. The rest is just apparitional. It's looking like this, looking like that. But if we take it step by step and view it from the yogi's point of view, you will see that what happens at the fundamental level will radiate, as it were, and influence the next level, the next level, the next level. Bearing in mind these ideas of koshas, that is, these sheaths, there will naturally be an influence from the fundamental level outward to the next level, to the next level, the next level. Fundamental level to the level of buddhi, then to manas, and then to prana, and then to the physical body. Very often I'm asked, so what is the difference between Atman and Jiva? And we even use the yogic language, what is the difference between Purusha? Purusha means a person. So Purusha and uh, what is the difference between Purusha and Jiva? Jiva is everything minus the physical body. Well, including the physical body, but when the physical body goes, we still have Jiva. Jiva is the accumulation of everything carried over, looking for another body to work through and to energize. So naturally, the practice of yoga, the practice of sadhana, the practice of discernment, the practice of detachment, what is detachment? No longer having for any thirst for anything. And what is uh, discernment? Well, discernment is the basis for it. So the body changes. It is not the same body that you had before the practice. You see in art, they pick this up. Saints have halos. And the halo is just a representation of the whole body beaming energetically. Somebody asked me about uh, uh, some time ago, when was it? I'm not sure about uh, incorrupt bodies. What is this incorrupt body? A saint dies and the body remains incorruptible. Well, it does corrupt, it just corrupts more slowly because all that energy of this mystic yogi is still vibrating in the body and beyond it. Somebody who hasn't got that level of thought or that level of spiritual elevation then the body doesn't beam with that. And the Bhagavad Gita also mentions that it comes out physically in the life of the Sri Ramakrishna, described as the body was always shining like gold, that kind of thing, says Holy Mother. In fact, outdoing the gold, the gold luster of his amulet. So that is very really rational and can be explained because every new thought that we have must make, as it were, a new channel through the brain. And that explains the tremendous cons conservation of human nature. Conservation of human nature, why? Because we make new channels, no doubt, but at the same time, we don't really want to change. It's a resistance. Human nature likes to run through the ruts that are already there because it's easy. If we think, just for example's sake, that the mind is like a needle and the brain a substance, a soft lump before it, then each thought that we have 
makes a street, as it were, in the brain. The street would close up, but for the gray matter which comes and makes a, a, a lining to keep it separate. And we can see from the physiology of the brain how well that works. Now you see taxi drivers in London were given a task, go and find a new route. And then when they investigated what was the effect on the brain, they found new synapses, new nerve cards, new areas of the brain opening up. Called neuroplasticity. If there were no gray matter, there would uh, be no memory because memory means going over these old streets. What a beautiful phrase. What is memory? It means going over these old streets again and again and again. We remember. We go to a new town and we get confused. We don't know what's left or right, particularly if somebody else takes us there. We didn't pay attention to the route. And then we're left. Okay, please. Sort yourself out, find your way home. Then you see, if you're asked to do that for a week at a time, then you know you won't get lost. These are familiar streets now because your memory has understood the familiar route. Now, perhaps you have marked, he says, um, that. Uh, when one talks on subjects in which one takes a few ideas that are familiar to everyone and combines and recombines them, it's easy to follow because these channels are present in everyone's brain. And it is only necessary to recur to them. But whenever a new subject comes, new channels have to be made. So it's not understood readily. And that is why the brain, it is the brain and not the people themselves, refuses unconsciously to be acted upon by new ideas. It resists. And in the copy I have here where every note is taken and underlines are there, I put there, it resists. Why is spiritual practice so difficult? Because it's a new thing for many. And it resists. The brain resists. But once we get into the habit of it, and once it becomes familiar to us, and once we start enjoying the process, the resistance goes, and the struggle for spiritual practice yields to something much more rewarding and useful. The prana is trying to make new channels, and the brain will not allow it. This is the secret of conservatism. The fewer channels there have been in the brain, and the less the needle of the prana has made these passages, the more conservative would be the brain, the more it will struggle against new thoughts. The more thoughtful the man, the more complicated would be the streets in his brain, and the more easily he will take to new ideas and understand them. We want somebody to be creative and flexible, then that resistance has to be broken. The resistance is broken by asking investigative questions. How, why, what, where, when, and so on. So with every fresh idea, we make a new impression in the brain. Uh, uh, cut new channels through the brain stuff. And that is why we find that in the practice of yoga, it being an entirely new set of thoughts and motives, there is so much physical resistance at first, physical resistance at first. Now, uh, I often say, and those who have been on the workshops that I give, uh, very frequently I say, I don't care if you agree with me or disagree with me. If you feel free to do whatever you want, but at least think differently. Make new channels in your brain. Become creative. Think for yourself. The, one of the ways I learned how to do mathematics that I wasn't that good at at the school was I thought every problem that is presented in the mathematical area, let me try and find a non-standard way of doing it and finding the answers. And in doing that, I understood perfectly what this mathematics was all about. 
That is why he says we find that the part that part of religion which deals with the world side of nature is no is so widely accepted, while the other part, the philosophy or the psychology, which deals with the inner nature of man, is so frequently neglected. We take the easy way. And then we must remember, and I is an asterisk paragraph. We must remember the definition of this world of, of ours. It is only, and there here comes the most beautiful, beautiful phrase that Swami Vivekananda gives. It is only the infinite existence projected into the plane of consciousness. And we come back to the original question that we started off the session with, finding out what is the structure of being to becoming and so on. And how do we get akasha and prana? What is the pre-step for that? What is the, the manifesting urge for that? Well, there it is. We must remember the definition of this world of ours. It is only the infinite existence projected into the plane of consciousness. A little of the infinite is projected into consciousness and that we call our world. If we really took this statement seriously, then it would shift all our ideas and we would look at things very differently. So there is an infinite beyond. And religion has to deal with both, of course. It has to deal with the little lump we call our world, with the infinite beyond. And any religion which deals only with the one of these two will be defective. Anyone who deals not with the material world, and here he is now telling us about practical Vedanta, if you like, hands-on, hands-on work as an expression of spiritual life, connecting the two, the inner and the outer worlds. So that part of religion which deals with the part of the infinite, which has come into the plane of consciousness, got itself caught, as it were, in the plane of consciousness and in the cage of time and space and causation is quite familiar to us because we are in that already. And ideas about this world have been with us almost from time immemorial. Now these brief statements are much more profound than may, you may probably think. Because the many questions come out the same as our original philosophical question, how do you get, instead of saying from the absolute to the relative, how do you get from a quantum field with matter and antimatter annihilating, annihilating itself to now? And we can tell the scientists and rephrase it slightly. You see, what is fundamental here is an infinite, an infinite existence, an infinite existence that um, projects itself, infinite existence, get back to the phrase here, the infinite existence that projects itself into the plane of relativity. A little of the infinite is projected into the relativity and our awareness of it and that we call our world. So there is an infinite beyond. This is a part of science, because what we're seeing is just the projected portion. And so it goes on. The part of religion which deals with the infinite beyond comes entirely new to us and getting ideas about it produces new channels in the brain, disturbing the whole system. And that is why you find in the practice of yoga, ordinary people are at first turned out of their grooves in order to lessen these disturbances as much as possible. Because it becomes a little bit of a shock in the beginning. All these methods are devised by Patanjali to assist you in a new direction that we may practice any one of them best suited to us. And there we leave 
the subject of prana for the time being. We pick it up um, when we next pick up the subject and go back to his specific chapter on prana, and then we'll make much more sense of it in the light of his commentary on this particular sutra. So we leave it there. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Guru Mahagat Swami Ji. Thank you, Guru Mahagat. Mahagat Swami Ji. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you, Swami Ji. Okay, all good. Thank you, Swami Ji. Thank you. Oh.